NASA is not excellent at creating space vehicles, but they are very good at coming up with many amazing ideas to serve human space exploration. Among that, can't help but mention the concept of an inflatable space station. However, its fate in the 20th century is also similar to many other abandoned NASA projects, given that getting canceled due to overcost or policy change. Fortunately, everything has changed in this century. The emergence of a gigantic and low-cost rocket-like SpaceX Starship has facilitated the ambitious unicorns to revive this great idea. Of course, it's not easy to operate a space balloon for human life, but I firmly believe that 21st century human intelligence will defeat all. Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap. On April 9, at the 39th Space Symposium, a new space startup company, Max Space, proposed its own interesting idea about inflatable space habitat. Among their series of expandable modules, the first of which is scheduled to launch on a SpaceX rideshare mission in 2025. That Max Space 20 module, compacted into a volume of 2 cubic meters for launch, will expand to 20 cubic meters after deployment, making it the largest expandable module flown to date. While a version of the Max Space 20 module is being built for testing, the company intends to quickly move to larger modules with volumes of 100 to 1,000 cubic meters, the latter the approximate volume of the entire ISS later this decade. Their big, exciting goal is to launch the space station's equivalent of volume in one Falcon launch, with such a module costing as little as $200 million. Such modules offer a less expensive solution for future commercial space stations and also provide a lot of interesting space applications, like in space manufacturing, biosciences, and pharma. However, their first module will aim at government agencies interested in using the modules as in space propellant depots or other storage. Unlike many competitors, building its own station is not Max Space's goal. Instead, they want to become a supplier to other companies developing commercial space stations, such as through NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program, or CLD. Apparently, Max Space is not pioneering in designing and commercializing the inflatable space module in this century. Prior to Max Space, we heard at least one time about Sierra Space with their design, namely the Large Integrated Flexible Environment, or LIFE for short. The combination of multiple LIFE habitats will form part of the Orbital Reef Commercial Space Station, which is being developed in a partnership between Sierra Space and Blue Origin. Orbital Reef is partly funded by a Space Act agreement administered by NASA. LIFE's biggest variant has a volume of 5,378 cubic meters in the operational stage, meaning five times SpaceX's Starship, and can fit inside an eight-meter fairing and is scheduled to be launched in the late 2000s. Definitely, it's going to go with Starship on that one. Sierra will start off with the LIFE 1.0 module, which will be deployed to LEO by late 2025 or early 2026 using a ULA Vulcan 5-meter fairing for launch. The first orbital version, LIFE 1.0, will be configured as a 285 cubic meter unit measuring 6 meters long by 9 meters in diameter. From the outside, LIFE looks like it would make for a cramped living space for four people. But, as they say, it's bigger on the inside. The interior houses three floors of living and workspace, complete with a medical bay, science labs, robotic stations, a galley, two hygiene centers, and a toilet. There's also exercise equipment, docks for iPads for movies during downtime, and a multi-tiered space garden to provide fresh produce for the astronauts. The habitat's outer mesh is made from super strong Vectrin, a material used in making bulletproof vests designed to keep the pressurized interior of the habitat comfortable for the crew. There's an inner urethane bladder to keep the air inside, a middle nylon layer, along with several layers of four inch thick foam and six sheets of Kevlar. Along with the bigger and bigger size of the life module, the demand for a rocket with a larger payload area has increased as a result. I'm pretty sure that in BFRR's wild days, SpaceX could predict a future where reusable transportation with a larger payload capacity and low cost would be the trend. And they are correct. To be honest, in the 20th century, inflatable module projects were developed but could not last long because of many reasons. The first formal design and manufacture was in 1961 with a space station design produced by Goodyear, although this design was never flown, 
NASA first started experimenting with the concept of expandable habitat modules back in the 1990s, and practical examples were being launched into orbit by the early 2000s. After NASA had done plans for what we now know as the International Space Station, it was understood that most of the components for the orbiting complex would need to fit inside the payload bay of the space shuttle. This requires station modules of size to be largely cylindrical in shape and no longer than approximately 18 meters. The tricky bit was that the shuttle's payload bay was only 4.6 meters wide. Although this allowed for modules slightly wider than what had been used thus far for Mir with 4.15 meters in diameter, it was a considerably humble number compared to the 6.6 .6 meters diameter orbital workshop module of Skylab. Thanks to that, the idea of an inflatable habitat module was born that could be packed into the shuttle's payload bay and then expanded to its final size of 8 meters once in orbit and filled with air. The proposed module, known as TransHab, was to be divided into multiple decks, providing living and working areas for the astronauts, as well as ample storage. There would have been six individual crew cabins, a dedicated workout area, medical facilities, a fully equipped kitchen, and a large wardroom table that could be used for all hands meetings or group meals. Unfortunately, in 2000, R&D phase on inflatable modules like TransHab was canceled by NASA due to delays and cost overruns on the overall ISS program. Later, the private company Bigelow Aerospace revived the design for use in a number of potential civil and commercial applications. One of the improvements they made was the addition of Vectron to the inflatable structure. Twice as strong as Kevlar, this manufactured fiber is spun from a liquid crystal polymer and had previously been used in the airbag which allowed Pathfinder to safely land on Mars in 1997. The shape of the module is maintained by the pressure difference between the internal atmosphere and the outside vacuum. The inflatable Bigelow Aerospace modules have an internal core that provides structural support during its launch into orbit. Their original module, Genesis 1 and 2, were launched into orbit between 2006 and 2007. In 2016, a $17.8 million module called BEAM was provided to NASA and then delivered to the station inside the unpressurized trunk of a SpaceX Dragon. Unlike Genesis, Beam could expand both its length and diameter. When packed into the Dragon's trunk, it was 2.16 meters long and 2.36 meters in diameter. After an expansion process, which took seven hours, it measured 4.1 meters long with a diameter of 3.23 meters. It was decided to use it for storage, and it would remain attached to the ISS until at least 2028. After Bigelow Aerospace suspended operations entirely in 2021, Sierra Space has emerged as the new industry leader for space-bound expandable structures. Following Sierra Space, we also witnessed the participation of Max Space, as I said. One of the main driving forces for the emergence of unicorns in this field comes from the development of modern rockets, capable of carrying large loads, but at extremely low prices, most typically Starship. This helps the firms to cut down the redundant costs and thus invest more in R&D activities. However, obstacles are inevitable because such projects often aim to diversify customer segments, not only astronauts. Imagine with Starship's high flight cadence, how many people suddenly be working in low Earth orbit? Keep in mind that major of those don't have the perfect health profile like astronauts. This leads to an overload in the medical system in space. According to Sierra Space's new chief medical officer, Dr. Tom Marsh, emergencies or medical problems that occur in space may include the following, cardiovascular events, slight headaches, a virus problem, too much carbon dioxide, dental issues, infection, and so forth. In that case, he said, it would be better to screen people before they go up and prepare the basic medical kits. Additionally, it's required to have a close connection to the expert on the ground. In an emergency when they must take the patient home, a Dream Chaser space plane capable of low G return to compatible commercial runways worldwide at fast speed will be utilized. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.